Thanks, Chris. So he's going to talk about uh, some CDS geogams um, on, 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 on focusing on resilience. You have your slide, right? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so this is something slightly different to what we're seeing. So, um, my name's Chris Skinner, I'm a research fellow, and I look at, um, I'm, I'm a numerical modeler, so I look, I use the Caesar Lidgewood model, which is a huge complexity landscape evolution model, and I look at the interactions between flooding and geomorphology. But what I'm actually going to talk about is a uh, kind of side project, my public engagement work, um, which is trying to communicate some of that modeling. So, this is a project I've got called Serious Geogames. It fits into this wider project called the Earth Arcade, which is kind of our public facing. Um, <laughs> public facing arm of the uh, Energy and Environment Institute at the University of Hull. So, as I said, my research, I'm a research fellow, I hold the research fellowship funded by the University of Hull. Um, I use the numerical model, Caesar Lids Floods. Um, and particularly, I'm looking at the interactions between flooding and geomorphology. So, my current work is looking at the natural flood management schemes, like the leaky dams and things going in there. So, it was interesting seeing Sean's. Uh, talk early on Hebden Bridge because my PhD student is actually going out to observe those um, structures in there to see how, there was, how the river is responding to putting these infrastructure under the river. Um, and some of the work I've done in the past uh, has been focused on the Humber Estuary. So this is a model run um, I, I did for the uh, UK Environment Agency as part of their Humber Flood Risk Management Strategy uh, of the Humber Estuary. So full is about there. And what this is showing is what would happen around the estuary if we did nothing to the flood defences for 100 years and we just allowed one metre of sea level rise to affect it. And it's based on a storm surge we had in 2013, which was about two metres above the high tide. Um, and what we're really fighting against in Hull is this kind of apocalyptic mindset. So this is a map of Hull, this is taken from the Climate Central website, and I've put the one metre sea level rise in there. This is quite a coarse tool, a simplistic tool. It basically uses mean sea level and uh, the sort of radar topography emission data. I just mapped which areas are below sea level. So if you look at Hull, it's pretty much the whole city is below there. So when people who live in Hull see these maps, they don't see that this is risk. They see this as the city's going to be underwater. We've actually had um, people in really influential positions, like the head of the Royal Town and Plan Planning Institution, saying that Hull is going to be underwater in 100 years' time, and no one's doing anything about it. Now, what we just saw in the last slide, with the, with the modelling, is that's not true. Even with the current flood defences, for normal tidal conditions, there won't be flooding in Hull, because those flood defences are designed to keep our storm surge. So we actually have this difficulty of trying to communicate to people that the risk of flooding is going to massively increase, but they don't have to move out of the city. And this mindset is ingrained. So we had uh, always the UK city of culture in 2017, so we've had loads of different cultural events throughout the year. The two key uh, flagship um, performances of that, the two, two uh, performances, were both based on the theme that the city was going to get wiped off and the survivors were going to have to move somewhere else or rebuild. Um, and this actually disengages people from agencies looking at flood risk. So the Environment Agency is, is currently working on about a £40 million pound scheme on the front of the hall. And you hear a lot of people saying, why are they spending £40 million pound on flood defences when we're all going to have to move in 100 years? So I try to come up with a way that I can communicate my model results to the public to try and dispel some of those myths and get them to engage in flood risk in a way which is um, helpful. So I came up with a serious geo game and there's three components or four components to serious geo games. So we start with video games. Now video games are big business. They're something about uh, in the UK, they're about £3.8 billion, pound, which is more than half the entertainment market in the UK, so that includes films and music. Um, about an estimated 2.3 billion people around the world play computer games. Uh, we also use virtual reality. Now, this is a really good hook. You get someone sat down in a virtual reality headset, and suddenly you begin drawing people towards them to see what's going on. 
But also virtual reality really allows you to engage people in experiential learning and non-mediated learning, which is really, really powerful. If you combine that with games, you have a really powerful combination. All, uh, all the Series 2 games are designed to be run in a kind of festival type event, so a science festival type event. And what's really powerful about these science festivals is it connects the member of the public with a scientist. So I've got someone in the headset using these games and I'm talking to them about my science and they can talk to me about my science and we can have a conversation that really facilitates that. But the key component is right in the middle of this is the game is either built around a computer model or it's built around the data that we use. And for modelling this is, it's really important that we allow people to get hands on with models and use them. So just two weeks ago I was listening to um, Joe Clark from Reading University, who's been working on the Landwise project, and she did a survey of um, stakeholders from the public and the public uh, about flood management and what and what things they think are useful for flood management. And they found in the survey that people felt modelling was important; it was an important component of that, but only for cost-benefit analysis. So people only think our models are useful for cost-benefit analysis. So we have a communication gap as modelers with the public. Um, so why are we doing it? What are the objectives we're trying to come, I'm trying to get out of this project? Um, I want to create a positive experience for people. I put this, out, this clip out in because actually this is a really bad thing to do. If you tell kids that learning is fun, then you've lost them. <laughs> um, but we want to create a positive experience. We want people to think, oh, I spoke to that, that model and I used that computer model and I enjoyed it. Um, we also want to increase people's curiosity, curiosity and interest in the subject. So we want people to be more likely to seek out information about it. And this is all for the purpose of planting seeds. So this is putting something into people's heads to say, so when they engage with people in the future, so if they engage with the environment agency or another modeler, um, where it might be something to do with their own personal flood risk, they are more likely to engage in that because they've had that positive experience and they've had their, in, their interest in that subject increase. So this is just a little clip of the first game that we made, which was Humber in a Box. So this, we merged our Caesar Lisford model that I showed you on the second slide um, in with the Unity gaming engine. They both they both use C sharp, so we just built the code, the hydraulic code into the gaming engine. I think this is the the, the first ever merging of a, a research grade model with uh, a gaming engine. Um, and this so the user walks around this room, which looks like a museum room, looks at the three D model on the table. They can watch the ties going in and out because the, the code is running dynamically. And then with a press of a button, they can raise the sea level in there. So this example, I put it up to ten meters. Um, kind of approximate of the Japanese tsunami to see what would happen if that sort of tsunami would hit the Humber estuary. And you see there's a hull, um, there's uh, Grimsby around there. Um, so this, this is a, an area where 25% of the UK's goods come into it and it would just be completely wiped off the map with this. But we can use this, we can get people to put one metre sea level rise in and they can see there's not actually that much flooding around the estuary. And we can talk to them about um, so what I'm going to talk about now is the analysis of our second game, which was one called Flash Flood. So this one didn't use modelling at all, but it did use some data um, that we gathered from the field. So this is a little river catchment called Tinnock Burn in the north of England, in the uplands. Um, it was kind of a nice little gentle stream, about a metre wide. This was it in 2006. So we used, we've got a lecturer who used to go and do a field trip here every year. Had really nice preserved terraces. It really showed you the effects of climate change and sea level rise on the geomorphology of an area. And he went back one year and it looked like this. So this is uh, the same area but a year later on Google Earth. So what happened, there was a convective storm about four kilometres um, west of where this was taken. It collected all the water, funneled it in the steep uplands and it just it created a debris flow which went down the river. These are quite rare in the UK, but they do happen. And it's literally like someone driven a bulldozer right down the river. So we could go back and we could scan it again. So we actually had really 
good high quality data from before and after flood of this sort of event. And as we're talking about resilience, this is an example of geomorphic resilience. So this was a threshold event. Um, it was powerful enough that it's actually changed the behavior of the river. So it was a single channel river system, very stable. Now it's kind of a, it's sort of a multi-channel. It's very, very dynamic. It, much smaller floods are able to move a lot more material. Uh, and even 12 years after this flood, it's still in this state. So it's still in this period of recovery. Um, and this is what our game looks like. We built that again in Unity 3D. It allows users to walk around the, the system, the catchment. Um, it shows them what the flood might look like if they were in it at the time. And then it shows them what the flood looks like afterwards. Um, and we demo, demo this, so we use lots of uh, laptops and headsets. These are all branded up with our O5K brand. Businesses use branding to try and sell their goods and engage people, so why shouldn't we use branding to do that? We drop this into a wider space of multiple activities, so there are laptops down at the back. This is a big touchscreen table that we use to, um, to kind of talk to people in more detail, so we have interactive PowerPoint presentations on there and the scientists talking about their particular research on there and various other activities around. And then we kind of evaluate it by getting feedback through post-it notes and card notes and things like that. And we also use uh, analytics of our online tools to get evaluation. So again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to give people a positive experience and we're trying to increase their curiosity. So objective one, that positive experience, so from this event, which was at the Hall Science Festival in 2018, we got about 70 post-it notes of people feeding back. Um, just over 40 of those were relating specifically to the Flash Flood VR game. Um, the, mostly they were generic, like, I enjoyed it, I had fun. But some of them were more specific, so things like, uh, I enjoyed seeing what it was like to be in the middle of a river, or I enjoyed walking into trees and things like that. People seem to enjoy doing that. Um, we had a lot of requests that people actually wanted more game-like features in there. So we were, people were just walking around. People actually wanted an objective. Uh, a lot of kids actually want a zombie they can shoot or something like that. So um, maybe we could add that into it. The only one negative comment we had was that they, uh, they liked it mostly apart from the graphics, which is a bit disappointing because it's the first time we were running it with the improved graphics. It's the second version of it. And we just... Spent a lot of money improving the graphics. So, um, so I, and anecdotally, people absolutely love it. Kids, kids really enjoy it. Once you get someone in the headset, you get loads of people around. Uh, it's funny seeing it at exhibits because with all the exhibits around it, we've got two or three people, and you usually have a crowd of kids waiting to go on the headsets. Um, so they definitely enjoy it. They definitely get a positive experience out of it. Um, curiosity. So we mainly assess this by looking at whether it's driving any traffic towards our, our Twitter, our Facebook, and our YouTube channels. Um, and we actually find that we do get some traffic. So this is looking at the NERF on Earth event we did in 2017, and this was in November. So we can see there was a, an increase in all the traffic here, and in particular all our flash flood videos which were on YouTube actually saw an increase. Um, because the analytics, we can break this down into dates, we actually found that the week before the event, we had about 50 views on our used, on those flash flood videos. During the event, we had about six over the four-day event. And then after the, the week after the event, we had another 50. So that 50 before really is driven by us plugging the event on Twitter and sharing the videos. And the 50 afterwards, um, we could probably say people who have been to the event and, and then looking at the videos afterwards. Um, big question on this though is who is our audience on social media? So those people who are getting driven there by the social media, are they the public we want to engage or are they just other practitioners and other scientists who are just curious at what we're, we're getting up to? I think this is a, an interesting question. I think something we have to grapple with is who our audience is on these online platforms. So just to summarise, I think the serious geo games have been successful in driving that, those objectives of fun and curious, curiosity in participants. Um, so I just want to highlight some of our, this is our Twitter account here, this is our website here if you want to go to that, and just sneak in the other objective at the bottom, which is, are we actually helping to plant seeds for future engagements? 
and how on earth do we evaluate that when these people that we're talking to say positive engagement might come when they're homeowners decades down the line how do we evaluate that how can we show that so thank you this uh, very interesting talk so any interesting questions yeah yeah that's a very interesting thing, a very interesting uh, thing. But I'm wondering uh, how would you link this thing to resilience or risk? That's our topic here. I think. Well, the, I think that the, if you engage people with their flood risk, so Humber and Box is engaging people with their flood risk, um, we're trying to dis dispel this notion that um, in the future the city is going to be underwater. And trying to engage them with what is actually the flood risk, which is from storm surge, from tidal flooding, and especially with sea level rise. If we can engage people with that, they're more likely to engage with us as modelers and also practitioners who are trying to put in uh, flood mitigation um, interventions. Um, and then that drives resilience. If people are, they know about the subject, they're more prepared, they'll be more resilient. Is there any um, option to interact with the model? I mean, as a player, you with this, you can play with the model, or what? You just uh, look for. So the the hum and the box, they 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 watch the tide coming up, but they're in control of the sea level rise. So it begins at zero, and they can press a button and raise it by one meter, and then they can continue to keep raising it up until a hundred meters, and it actually goes down to minus ten. So. Quite often you'll get someone that just put their finger on the trigger and stick it straight up to 100 meters and this massive wave just goes and floods everything. Um, but if that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. It, what it allows us to do is actually have a conversation with them and talk to them. And then once they've flooded it, we can then go, right, reset it, put it to one meter, and then they can see that actually there's not that much flooding. And we can say this has the actual flood defenses built into the model. This is the model that is used locally to look at the flood risk um, and they've kind of done their own experiment and seen that that conception it, it, it's not true and then we can say right when we get storm surges this is where the flood is and that's going to increase in the future but people are planning for it and preparing for it so any questions I see that um, a lot of learning here is about the kind of the hard skill knowledge. How much of this, you know, kind of interactions uh, you're designing here for the kids, for the players together, uh, for them to, to interact a little bit? Because we have learned from a lot of the other talks the, the vulnerability, you know, dimension of risk, of resilience, and uh, they're, they're largely kind of social. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, is there a plan to do more attention to this? I think so, yeah. I think um, I think the problem I have is actually, this, this because this isn't my main research field, this is kind of like a, a side project, I've not really been able to develop the, the gaming side of everything on there. The, they're largely visualizations within a, a gaming style interface. Um, but I think there's huge potential there for, for incorporating more gaming elements, which would then engage people more. I'd love to have that in a box game where people could actually put their own flood defences around the estuary or, or at least swap in different scenarios for flood defence into the next 100 years or so and allow people to do their own experiments and draw their own conclusions off the back of those. I think that's, that's where the real power of kind of gaming and VR and this sort of approach would come from. But it's massively expensive. Questions? Yeah, I think the last point, really, you mentioned the costs of developing such a tool. Can you give us a bit, bit of an understanding? For example, we heard this morning of age based models. If they further develop or want to communicate the results of the age based model for households or for young kids, um, how expensive and how much effort would 
if you need to spend into this to make for every egg you place more than a series of two. <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends on how far you want to go down. And if you can find someone who is able to learn those skills in Unity, it's actually quite an intuitive program. So if you've got someone who has that flair who can develop in 3D, then you can reduce your cost massively. I have to work, I work with indie games developers, so I have to kind of hire them at an hourly rate to develop this. So the, the Flash Flood game cost us about £12,000 to, to develop. Um, and that didn't incorporate building a, a numerical model into the, the gaming engine. It was a visualisation and an animation of the flood. So, um, yeah, I think the way to bring down that cost is to find someone who's willing and able to to use those programs. Well, maybe you can say you just need half a million heroes to <laughs> and collaborate with all with this agent based yeah. model. <laughs> anyway, uh, any quick or final question or comment? Yes. Do you think such a, games also have a, a place in the collection of data? Or would it also be possible to use this to collect um, behavioral rules of people? By, by... I, I think so, definitely, yeah. I think you could um, almost, if you could put a game like this on as a, as a web game or mobile game, um, now people make selections of how they would defend it and replay and then you collect simple data of what background they have um, and things like that. I think you would be able to sort of get behaviour out of there. Um, I think there's huge scope for that, especially with things like big data coming along as well. I think there's there's massive scope. Um, so I, I would I would push games. I actually um, run a last two years we run a gaming session at EGU which has been really popular. Um, we do a gaming night there which we had about 300 people turn up and can play sort of all sort of geoscience type games. But some of the research we have, people presenting that, is just mind blowing. Um, so I think there's, there's massive potential in games for data collection, communication, and driving research and all sorts of things. So powerful tools. Thanks, Chris. Um